Good evening, folks. My name is Ross Claddy, and it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and fellow writer, Brian Dion, who will read from his latest publication, a short novel very aptly entitled Echoes. I forget exactly when I joined the monthly writers group that began in Brian and Judy Dion's home in the uphill section of Nelson, and so came to know Brian as a talented fiction writer. His guess is some 15 years ago, which sounds about right. Previously, I'd been aware of him as a stage actor and writer of radio plays. The dramatic skills he learned in those pursuits carry over, I think, into his prose, giving his writing a page-turning lilt, a dramatic flair. Echoes is a case in point. It's an ingenious, even plausible tale of a young Canadian in modern Greece and his encounter with a young woman who has a special gift. The book rollicks along so that you can't put it down. Brian. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ross. I'd like to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> I read it. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, so, uh, so my plan for tonight, I think, is to read uh, the beginning of the book uh, to get you to the point where you can decide whether you'd like to continue with the story or not. Uh, about 15 minutes worth, I think, possibly a little longer if I keep myself to a good pace. Um, then a chance for questions, and they can be questions certainly about the story um, or about the process of self-publishing because um, this, this whole, I call it an experiment because it's not a traditional book launch. For one thing, it's not a book in a, in a traditional sense. It's 33,000 words long, which is a novella size, not an actual novel. Um, but I was very interested in going through the process of doing every bit of the self-publishing. So the cover's mine, my photo, the layout's mine, everything's mine. It was with the help of, of Amazon, which has, you know, format has designed itself to make it easy for people to self-publish. I was able to do all those steps by myself with the help of some convenient and free software. So I wanted to go through that whole process. And so now the book, the novella is available as an ebook. And if you get an ebook copy, you get to see all the photographs in it. And there's quite a few. They're all mine. Um, but if you choose to get a paperback, there won't be any photos in it because it's a little bit cost prohibitive to put a bunch of color pages into your book. At least it makes it a lot more expensive. Anyway, so that's part of what this is about. I just wanted to go through that process to see if yeah. authors like me, who have a lot of trouble attracting traditional publishers, uh, can find another way to get their work out there to friends and other interested people. And so this is the sort of the finale to that process. So uh, I'll begin reading in a moment. I'm gonna share my screen. So you will have an opportunity to follow the text if you wish. Uh, my face will probably be on the side, but my face is not what you're here for, I don't think. Okay. Yes, there we go. So I went through the process of getting an ISB number, which as a Canadian writer, you can do for free. Um, I call my publishing company Homestar Press, as I did for the first publication I did. Uh, all that is an option that I can do, even though I'm doing it through Amazon, I still get to call it my own publishing company. And in the beginning of the book, I write three maximum maxims outside the temple of Apollo and Delphi. Know thyself, nothing to excess, and certainly brings insanity. Love the last one. <clears throat> <clears throat> it struck young Thomas like a bolt of lightning. The fact that a long dead Roman poet could speak to him as if he were sitting in the same room. Let us live, my lesbia. Let us love and all the words of the old and so moral, may they be worth less than nothing to us. Who was? This irascible man, lusty, frantic, vitriolic, and humorous all in one. How could it be that Catullus' world was so much like his own, full of hypocrites, frustrations, desire, and unrequited love? The implications were huge. Till this moment, Thomas had thought this was a description only of his world. Lesbia, you ask how many kisses of yours would be enough and more to satisfy me? as many as the grains of Libyan sand, or as many as the stars when night is still, gazing down on secret human desires. Oh, yes. And so many kisses did Thomas dream of too, when he thought of svelte Monica sitting directly in front of him in history class. 
Oh, Monica of the volleyball court. Oh, lesbia. Fundamentally, people did not change. This was the extraordinary lesson Latin class had entrusted to Thomas. On the one hand, this realization depressed him because so much of human nature seemed in dire need of change. On the other hand, it opened up a whole new dimension of potential brotherhood. New friends, even soulmates, were now available across the great expanse of human history. In a very fundamental way, they all spoke the same language. Thomas, his Latin teacher asked, Thomas, are you still with us? Sorry, Thomas said, almost knocking over his mug of coffee. I must have been daydreaming, he was about to say, but why state the obvious? Uh, you want me to translate the next line? If you would be so good. Mr. Gladstone smiled. He wore glasses, had thinning hair, and his goatee was peppered with gray. Of all the teachers of Paul M. Marston High School, Mr. Rupert Gladstone was the most professorial. He even had a residual English accent. This clinched it for Thomas, catapulting Mr. Gladstone into a category apart. Good God, he even let his graduating students bring coffee into class. Thomas was among just a dozen students taking grade 13 Latin. The very fact that they were there at all, instructor as well as students, marked them as eccentric, even oddities. After all, why would one waste one's time studying a long dead language when they could take physics or German or but there they were, each of them for reasons arcane and personal, and together, like members of a secret cabal, they searched for treasure. That moment I see you, Lesbia, nothing's left of me, but my tongue is numbed, and through my poor limbs fires are raging. The echo of your voice rings in both ears. My eyes are covered with the dark of night. Since grade nine, Thomas had tried a little bit of everything. He did some cross-country running. He worked on the school literary paper. He had established himself as something of a poet, learned to play the guitar, even wrote a few songs that friends claimed reminded them of Phil Oaks. But what distinguished him most, in his own mind at least, was the fact that he studied Latin. Arma varimco calo troiae qui prima saboris. Virgil's dactylic examiner echoed in Thomas's head. Heroic deeds, battles, treacheries, vasto vastare, and the misadventures of the Olympian gods. It was a boisterous world, at once both far and near. So, um, Mr. Gladstone, would you say that Roman culture pretty much adopted Greek culture wholesale? Earlier, Thomas had asked this same question of the class's resident genius, Daniel Porter. Thomas was eager to compare answers. Mr. Gladstone nodded sagely took his time, sipped from his coffee. His eyeglasses fogged up briefly. Well, Thomas, the short answer would be yes. If you really want to understand the Roman mind, you have to start with the Greeks. It was this simple statement confirming Daniel's opinion that set Thomas on his journey. If Greek had been offered at Paul S. Marsden, he would have enrolled in it straight away, but he could study Greek on his own. For Thomas knew, even at 17, that being the highly visual person he was, he would have to see for himself. He would have to witness firsthand the beginnings of Western culture, to see the birthplace of Lesbia, to see where drama was born, to see the naked marbles that came to define female beauty, all of that and more. University could wait. Mr. Gladstone's Latin students could hardly be characterized as practical. It was doubtful any of them would become mechanics, dentists or accountants, although who knew what Daniel would decide. But Thomas was at least practical enough to know it would serve him better to learn modern Greek than classical, though in fact he tried to do both. He bought the necessary books and tapes. Over and over for half a year, he mumbled to himself in, in his bedroom phrases like, Oina Tarakea, where are the ruins? And a hundred other phrases he thought might come in handy. Still, his mother argued, shouldn't he get his degree first? It was mid-September 1972, the sun barely risen. Thomas should have been in a lecture hall at the U of T following his second year of studies in humanities, whatever that was. Instead, he sat in the back of a bus on the road between Athens and Delphi. <coughs> Passing traffic hypnotized him. Hypnos from the Greek word for sleep. Motorbikes, small trucks, few cars, and even the occasional herd of goats. 
After about three hours, the mountains grew steeper and the road more treacherous. Thomas pressed his nose against the bus window, gazing intently at the misty valley that opened on his left. Could that be the Peloponnese in the distance? His heart quickened. Beyond that low bank of clouds lay Arcadia, home to the temple at Basse, which he hoped to visit soon. And then Olympia, where ancient athletes vied for glory, Citius, Altius, Fortius. The sound of air brakes announced their arrival. A dozen passengers rose from their seats. Many of the locals carried bundles wrapped in twine. An older man with a gray mustache leaned over to speak to his cat, who meowed tragically from inside its wire cage. Thomas studied the debussing with great interest. He moved to an empty seat on the right to improve his view. The driver had just opened the bus door and jumped out. Now he was pulling suitcases out from a lower bin and lining them up on the crumbling sidewalk. Then, keeping his cigarette firmly clenched between his lips, he retreated to the bus's rear, where Thomas caught a glimpse of him climbing up and disappearing. Thomas laughed to hear the sound of yet more luggage banging against the bus's roof, along with the clucking of chickens. <laughs> Thomas was last to gather his things. He had to stop for a moment to refasten the small tent strapped near the bottom of his pack. Just in front of him, second last to exit, stood a young woman of a complexion not quite olive, but not Scandinavian white either. She had straight, dark hair down to her waist. Thomas would have guessed she was Greek, but she too carried a backpack and wore tattered jeans and a tank top. She seemed to be as much a tourist as he was. He watched her hips sway as she walked down the center aisle. The sight reminded him of Stephanie Simpson in his grade 12 chem class. She too had great swaying hips. Did women realize how their hips swayed? Was it something they did on purpose? This seemed to Thomas an important question. Or was the swaying entirely unconscious? More than once, he had tripped and stumbled while watching Stephanie's hips enter room 218 of Paul S. Marsden. The few times he tried talking to her, he usually said something completely inane. So gradually he gave up even trying. Strange how swaying hips could do this to a person. To Thomas, certainly. Very likely to an ancient Roman as well, though probably not Catullus. The picture you're looking at is the uh, Temple of Apollo in Delphi. <clears throat> Thomas paid his 25 drachmas and passed through the wrought iron gate. Before him lay a wonderland of ancient excavation. Limestone blocks laid out in every direction. A chaotic jumble at first glance, but soon resolving into the outlines of ancient buildings. The sacred way zigzagged up the hill, passing the remains of treasury buildings erected for the glory of various city-states. Siphnos, Thebes, Argos, Athens. Each was a monument to the city's importance and influence of the ancient world, and ostensibly erected to give thanks to the oracle for her good advice. Mostly, it was a matter of prestige, but it was more than that too. For Delphi was, first and foremost, a holy place. To visit the sacred site was a very big deal, like being invited to visit the Queen of England. And you must come with gifts, obviously, generally a 10% tithe. Sacred was a word Thomas did his best to avoid. Yet how else to describe what he saw? Mount Parnassus formed a near vertical wall as Delphi's backdrop. Luscious cypress trees dotted the steep hillside. It was unnaturally quiet. Somehow the surrounding rocks seemed to absorb human sounds. To the south, south the gulf of Corinth lay half hidden in the mist. Thomas thought he could hear an eagle cry, or maybe it was a hawk. His knowledge of birds was limited. He craned his head upward, looking for the bird, but couldn't find it against the glare of the sun. Thomas walked quickly, breathless with excitement. It took very little effort to imagine gods and goddesses as his companions. That the most famous oracle of all should reside here made perfect sense. Delphi, Thomas whispered to himself. He shook his head. Anything beyond a whisper seemed sacrilegious. Delphi, he repeated, laughing slightly maniacally. I'm here at last. The temple of Apollo sat directly in front of him. Only six columns stood in the vertical and only one at its full height. But the foundation of the temple was well defined, and though earthquakes had long ago sent most of the structure tumbling to the ground, the stones were still in situ, 
only waiting to be reassembled at some future date. Thomas had no trouble reconstructing the temple in his head. Here was the home of the great oracle, the Pythia, Apollo's chief priestess. She resided somewhere inside the temple in some little recess below, an adjutant they called it. Strange vapors were supposed to emanate from the interior. People from all around the Greek world and beyond would come here to seek real advice on matters of importance. Should I go to war? Should I seek this alliance? Will I live long? Famously and very wisely, the oracle would generally respond with answers that were ambiguous. Only months before, Thomas had read an account about the Roman Emperor Nero's visit to Delphi. The Delphic priestess had, asked, had said to him, your presence here outrages the God you seek. Go back, matricide. The number 73 marks the hour of your downfall. Unhappy with the tone of the prophecy, Nero had the priestess burned alive, then returned to Rome to resume his depravities. But instead of living to the ripe age of 73, as Nero believed the oracle had promised him, he made it only to 30, falling prey to an eternal revolt led by Servius Galba. Galba was 73 years old at the time. <laughs> to the 20th century mind, it all seemed ludicrous. To take seriously advice about your future from some old hag who sat in a steamy hole, Indeed, the belief in the pantheon of gods who hoard and argued and behaved no better than most of humanity, how could people ever believe in such things? And yet, Thomas looked up at the blue sky and the white clouds zipping over the mountaintops like messenger gods. Was his own time really that much different? God, half his high school classmates read their daily horoscopes. They joked about it, but they read them faithfully. And Thomas had been to more than one gathering where someone brought out a Ouija or board or tarot cards. And as for predictions about the future, were the prognostications of modern politicians or scientists or worst of all, economists more reliable? Fundamentally, people do not change. Thomas was wakened from his reflections by a glimpse of a familiar figure at the far end of the temple, the young woman with the long dark hair. Why should Thomas be surprised? It was inevitable he would bump into her. Backlit by the sun, she was more apparition than real. How old was she anyway? 20, 22, 25? Did it matter? The apparition stood perf absolutely still. It was almost as if she were listening. She held a cigarette loosely between her fingers, letting the smoke drift up to the heavens. <laughs> Thomas quickly averted his eyes when the young woman finally noticed she was being watched. He reread the plaque which described the temple's history. Then he crouched down to retie his shoelace, which was only slightly loose. He took a deep breath. What was that scent in the air? Oleander? Didn't his mum have something like that in her garden? He moved on, proceeding slowly uphill. What if he were granted one question? What might he ask the oracle? Happy thought. Will the Maple Leafs ever win the Stanley Cup again? Will we find life on Mars? No, no, Thomas chuckled and kicked a stone. He would have to give such a scenario careful thought. What great piece of knowledge, what important piece of wisdom was humanity most in need of? On the other hand, he might simply ask, would he and the young woman with the dark hair ever become friends or more than friends? Or if not her, what about Svelte Monica or Stephanie or Thomas could be very open-minded about such things. <laughs> he took a moment to sip from his water bottle. He looked back down at the temple of Apollo. No sign of his mystery woman, but he had no doubt about the bird that flew over very low this time. It was definitely an eagle. The picture below shows the stadium in Delphi. <clears throat> Thomas continued quietly up the sacred way. Who knew whose footsteps had preceded him? Who knew what ancient conversations once bounced off these polished stones? He soon passed the amphitheater. It was much more impressive than the one he'd seen in Athens. He could imagine no backdrop more dramatic. Yet even so, enticing as it was, he could not resist the compulsion to keep moving. He'd always been this way. Before anything else, he must climb to the top, get an overall view. Even at the risk of dismissing the trees, he must first see the forest. Then he could return would return, return and do the place justice. Taking a drink from his water bottle, he read a sign written in both English and Greek. He didn't need the English. In fact, he resented it. If he'd gone to the trouble to learn Greek, why hadn't others? 
At the end of the words, to the stadium, was an upward pointing arrow. Thomas smiled. How odd to put the stadium at the very top. It was not enough that the athlete should have to run at full speed for 150 meters, sometimes in full armor, but first they would have to climb almost the same distance to reach the starting line. Beginning his trip in September had been a good choice. He'd had many of the sites almost to himself. Now that the Germans are gone, one of the archeological custodians had said to him, you can have the run of the place. This particular custodian was very proud of his English and refused to speak to him in Greek. I have a brother in Montreal. He explained to Thomas, right next door, yes? Thomas nodded. He'd never been to Montreal. The stadium was beautifully preserved, or restored, more likely. Many of the stone seats were in place. Even to the most untrained eye, there could be no doubt about what this space was used for. He's on a different page. Thomas chuckled to remember the time when he, too, was a runner. Back in grade eight, he had been the second fastest runner in the school. Quickest at the start, but never first at the finish line. That honor had always fallen to long-legged Gabriel. It would be Gabriel who wore the laurel wreath, Gabriel who was written up in poems, lifted on the shoulders of citizens, wined and dined and remembered in stories told around the hearth. Thomas did not mind. Second was good. Just to compete was good. And Gabe was a good person, a friend, the one in the end whom felt Monica was sure to dance with, Monica or Stephanie or both, but all this was fine. It was an honor culture, wasn't it? Honor and shame, winners and losers. Was his own time really much different? Immersed in the so-called Olympic ideal, the acclaim that came with gold, silver, and bronze medals. But after that, who cared? Who remembered? And during the Pythian games, the demarcation was even more severe. There was only one winner, only one wreath. To be supreme was everything, to be less was nothing. Family Cup, World Series, had anything changed? Thomas climbed over the rope, ignoring the no admittance sign. He walked up to the starting line, marked clearly by a long line of polished limestone. Go, he called out to himself and began pumping his legs, charging down the great long rectangle. His lungs burned, his heart leapt. He could have gone faster if he weren't wearing hiking boots, but it was glorious all the same. As he crossed the finish line, some 150 meters or so in the distance, he laughed out loud and bent over panting. Something made him turn. A spectator? A custodian ready to scold him? Whoever it was had disappeared down the walkway and merged into the shadows of the cypresses. A mocking raven cawed from a nearby tree. One other little small section I'd like to read if it's okay, uh, and this will introduce you to the next major character. Uh, this is a view of, of the theater in Delphi, and it, it's glorious. <laughs> what can I say? <clears throat> Thomas breathed in deeply. When he exhaled finally, it was a mindful act, an offering. His affirmation that he and Homer shared the same air molecules along with Socrates and a great pantheon of ancient Greek thinkers and artists. He stood, after all, at what the Greeks considered to be the center of everything. He had arrived. Zeus-like, with Parnassus at his back, Thomas surveyed the view below. There lay the Temple of Apollo, the bases of 42 columns evenly spaced around its perimeter. He could trace his path up the zigzagging sacred way, look down upon the treasuries in the valley beyond. Moving down the path a little, he could see the very top level of the theater, which called to him like a chorus of seductive sirens. The amphitheater was as perfect as a human structure could be. It fit into the hillside the way a female breast fit into a bra or twin buttocks into a pair of shorts, though sadly the comparison was not as yet based on first-hand experience. Here once sat an audience of 10,000. Thomas could feel the ancient excitement, the spicy mixture of ritual, worship, and entertainment, the gossip among old friends, the anticipation and readiness for surprise. His eyes beheld the very invention of theater itself. It all began here. There she was again, many levels below him. Again, she was silent, but no longer still. She was dancing on the stage floor, but mostly remaining in one spot, doing some Tai Chi kind of routine, making odd, sinuous movements with her arms, lunging gently, twirling in slow motion. It was beautiful. She stopped and looked up. Guten Morgen? What? Oh, right. Uh, good morning. 
Did Thomas really need to yell? The dancer's voice was clear and easily heard from the top tiers of the theater. You are American? She asked. Canadian, Thomas answered. Good, the dancer replied. She turned her attention away from Thomas, looking back out over the valley. As she walked across the pavement, it seemed to Thomas as if she floated, that she did not live in the same gravitational field as he did. Thomas hurried down the steps. He calculated that inane words mattered less when you were in a foreign country. You, you danced beautifully. He was still yelling. He would have to stop doing that. Excuse me? On top of everything, she had an accent. It was lovely. He couldn't place it at first. You're dancing. I hope you don't mind. I couldn't help but notice. Thomas was almost down to stage level. Just a few more steps. You think I am a dancer? When would he ever learn not to make assumptions? Well, I... Sheepishly, he lowered himself to the nearest seat. The young woman laughed and made another twirl. Her long, dark hair trailed behind her. You are not completely wrong. I am an actress. How wonderful. How is it wonderful? Thomas listened to how her words and laugh amplified and traveled to the upper tiers. Well, just consider where we are, he laughed stupidly. In a Greek amphitheater, in maybe one of the most dramatic settings on the planet, what could be a more appropriate place for an actress? I, I beg your pardon, appropriate? She seemed unfamiliar with the word. Uh, suitable, Thomas said. Fitting, the dancer nodded. Of course. She laughed again, making Thomas weak in the knees. You have so many words in English that mean the same thing. She smiled and walked closer. Well, not exactly the same thing. You have uh, Matisse. Uh, what is the word in English? Thomas took a stab. Uh, nuance? Exactamente. She sat down beside him and offered her hand. Suddenly, Thomas wished he had studied Spanish, not Latin. I am Lucia from Mexico City, and you? When Thomas thought of Mexico, he had visions of peasants sitting in the back of a dust, dusty carts with large wooden wheels, not the sophisticated, urbane woman who stood before him. She wore an amber necklace, and her hiking boots were brand new, top of the line. Thomas took the hand, wondering briefly if he was expected to kiss it. He settled for a limp handshake. He finally found his voice. Thomas, from Toronto, Canada. It was as if Lucia had just cracked a great puzzle. Toronto! She rolled her R's exquisitely. It is close to Stratford, yes? It is. Shakespeare, yes? One day I would like to perform there. And I, I would like to see you perform there. Damn, what a stupid thing to say. But Thomas was helplessly caught up in the rhythm of the exchange. Lucia's laughs were like leaves dancing in a sun that breeze. They stopped talking. Both stared out past the theater, beyond the temple, gazing out into the valley and the great peninsula beyond. Why are you here, Thomas of Toronto? What an existential question. Thomas buried his face in his hands. When he reopened his eyes, he hoped he had put aside all temptation to speak in platitudes. I guess you could say I'm exploring. Lucia nodded. It was enough for Thomas to continue. I, well, I have this thing for the classics, the ancient classics, I mean, Virgil, Homer, Socrates, more nods, a Mona Lisa type smile. And I studied Latin in high school. Finally, I realized that almost all the Roman writers and artists I admired really had their origins in Greece. So I figured if I wanted to understand them better, I needed to come to the source. Thomas smiled weakly. Does that make any sense? It does, Thomas of Toronto. Sweet Jesus, how Thomas loved the way she said Toronto, every vow are getting its due. I too am an explorer, Thomas. Thomas nodded happily. Lope de Vega, Shakespeare, Sophocles, it is as you say, we must return to the source. Exactamente, Thomas said. He rolled his eyes. What was he doing? Dabbling in the language he hadn't <laughs> knew at all. Muy bien, mi compadre, hable espanol. Thomas shook his head and looked down at his hiking boots. No, no, not really. A couple of words, hardly any. He looked up. I speak some Greek, though. Do you? That is very good. I'm far from fluent, mind you, but I know just enough to get by. To get by is useful. They both laughed and looked back out over the Peloponnese. Lucia took a deep breath, and Thomas watched in admiration. It is good that we are here, Lucia said. Thomas was about to reply, but Lucia put a hand on his arm and a finger to her lips. Her lips were large, supple. Not even Monica had such lips, nor Stephanie. Shh, Lucia said. Thomas nodded obediently. The stones speak to us, yes? There you go, there's the start. Wow.
Yeah, very nice. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> so if you have any questions, I'll try to address them. Um, or if not, I have a tiny little slideshow to show you. That was very, very sweet. Uh, I could identify with that uh, when I was 18. Uh -huh. how, how old were you then? What do you mean me? You mean Thomas? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, uh, probably 19 or 20. Mm. Yeah. yeah, my character's that age, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just starting university. Very sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, while you're thinking of your questions, then <laughs> I'm going to share you a little slide. Shall we show you show you some of the principal places that that, that uh, you find when you read the book? Uh, so I will just have to share my screen again. Great <laughs> location. <laughs> Hmm? It's going back. Oh, uh, we're watching this slide show. Oh. Uh huh. Ah. Uh. So all of these photos will be of, of scenes. Uh, there are scenes in the, in the story of, of each of the places I'm showing you here. Look at that, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're all in the book, all these pictures. Beautiful country. You can see a lot of the to hear him pronounce the, all those places because I can't. Yeah. Look at that. This, 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 this. this must have been really kind. Yeah. Hmm. <coughs> 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 Amazing. I remember that. So the, the mountain in the middle was the Saint the Parthian? Parthenon. Yeah, Parthenon. Very it was on a, it was on a, it's on a, yeah, on a wolf road. You should have more of that than you've been watching. You should yeah. have podcast on oh, yes. Charles Jeans, but maybe we can get to ready the camera. It must be the market. It's a market, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Look at that, huh? <coughs> Brian? Yes. You had a picture of a Minoan fresca. Was that fresco. on Crete? Fresco. Was that on Crete? Yeah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. well, one of them was from Santorini, actually, but the other one's from Crete. Yeah. I wonder how this time compares with the Mexican theaters. Oh, uh, probably over. Yeah. Oh, maybe the chairs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. With all those holes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That that's on Crete, I guess. Huh? Yep. These are pottery shards, fourth century BC. Mm -hmm. A slide on the hill there. Kathleen stayed in one of those caves, you know. Oh. Yeah, see those pillars? Mm -hmm. 
thick part is on the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by the Minoan civilization. Look, yeah. still there, yeah, Iran. Look, gotta fix that. Heraklion. <laughs> oh, yes. There, that's bull, 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 uh, bull riding. No, it's uh, leaping. Bull leaping. Leaping over they, top. Leap. He grabs the horns and and uh, throw themselves over the, over the bull. Yeah. Now I just recently learned that the women did the bull leaping as well. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and there we go. Yeah. When you get to the wow. Festus disc, you're near the end of the story. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I hope that gives you a taste. Uh, as I said, the paperback does not have any photos in it. Only the ebook version does. But uh, I know some people prefer to have a solid uh, physical book in their hands. So you certainly have that option if you want to go that way. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to reading Ross's copy on, the, on Kindle. It's on my Kindle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, obviously selling it at 99 cents, the intention was simply just to get people to read yeah, it, yeah. not to make any money. <laughs> but uh, again, the, the whole part of the process was to see, can I get my work out there without any financial expense? And I can, because I didn't have to spend a cent to get that book out there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have to hire cover designers, layout designers or anything. I did all that. And it wasn't that hard with the help of a few um, uh, internet uh, um, documents. I was able to figure it all out. And in fact, uh, Amazon, say what you might, you can say a lot of negative things about Amazon, but they really do give you a lot of resources of what you need to do if you want to publish your book with them. They'll, they spell it out in a lot of detail. So, yeah, there's, uh, how, to, how to not spend any money and publish a book. That's what this is about. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> so, well, Brian, I'm interested. So I, the pictures are yours. And so you've been in Greece and what, I mean, what led you to this story? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Um, well, yeah, I, the kernel of the story was, was the idea, well, without giving too much away, um, I thought, well, how interesting that, for some reason, it struck me the idea that if, if somehow the stones contain a record of of actual voices that were spoken in the past. That was the germ of the idea. And I thought, well, how, how, you know, how can I build a story around that, right? And uh, having, of course, been to Greece twice, uh, I had a lot of uh, physical detail to work with uh, as yes, a setting. I can, I can tell, the, germ of the, I, the germ of the idea came from, oh, how interesting it would be if somehow uh, the record of spoken language has been preserved over the years. And so that was the, uh, Hmm. The reason I wanted to write this, yeah. Wow, oh, okay, nice. Yeah, and then it must have been nice to, you know, make it and include the picture <laughs> along with it. <laughs> it takes us on a trip too. Right. Of course, that, that hadn't occurred to me when I was writing the story, but uh, once I was into it, I said, oh, I have pictures of this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. So, and that again, not one of the wonderful things about being able to to do it through the Kindle Amazon thing is that you can uh, make those pictures part of your book very, very easily. There's very little work, effort involved. Okay. So mm. it's great to be able to share the pictures that way. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So yeah. how can we access copies of this in terms of making sure that friends of ours can see this presentation. Well, uh, since I am recording this, I will um, put out a copy on Facebook, among my Facebook friends, of where you can, a link to the recording. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and other friends like, well, Ralph, you are on Facebook now, aren't you? <laughs> for, for a while we weren't Facebook friends, but he is now, so that, that'll work. Okay. Um... Sorry. No, oh, it's okay. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. And so that's good because I missed the first part. Of, mostly I missed this. So oh, I apologize. No, so but uh, yeah, it's so much fun to tune in and see uh, everybody that I know. It's great. Glad to hear you. Mm -hmm. 
So, so have you, Brian, have you talked about self-publishing other than what you just said right now? In uh, not, I haven't, you didn't miss too much in that regard, although you can, you can check it out in the recording, but uh, I, I know you are particularly interested in that. So I'll, I'll go over a few things if you like. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, if you are going to use Amazon, and I think it is by far the easiest, most convenient way to do no cost self-publishing, right? Um, if you are going to do that, it makes most sense to do an ebook first. Okay. Make it an ebook first. Um, you have lots of flexibility there and they can guide you through the steps. And from there, once you have your ebook up, it's a very easy conversion to a paperback. You don't have to make that many changes. One of the changes you have to make is you have to work from a, not an eight and a half by 11 format, but to a six by nine format, but that's simple to do kind of thing. Oh, okay. So there aren't too many, uh, but ebook first makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, I wrote the document originally in Word, and that was, I didn't have to do too many uh, special formatting there. I had to make sure I didn't use the tab key for para paragraphs, because that causes all kinds of formatting problems. Um, I couldn't use drop caps, which I like to use because they're quite attractive, but that didn't work very well. And I had to single space and save the document as uh, a web filtered document. Uh, that way, it can be easily converted to an EPUB document. That's what uh, all... Did you, did you say save it as a web filtered? Yeah, that's one of the options you have using Word. And I'm guessing uh, Open Office has that option as well. Um, anyway, Ralph, I can, I can write all this down for you if you like. I'm just going to go over it quickly. I'm okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and from there, uh, I, I used the program that my friend Dwayne recommended called Calibre. Or I think he calls it Calibre, but I think it's Calibre. And uh, uh, it will easily uh, change your web filter document to an EPUB document, which is what Amazon and any other online distributor needs. Okay, ebooks are all going to be published as an EPUB format, pretty much. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, pretty straightforward. And uh, I guess the only thing I would recommend, it's really important to choose a compelling cover because uh, that's the first thing that's going to attract people's attention when it's uh, your books online. Um, mm -hmm. And again, the, the cost is basically zero. Um, you get to decide on the pricing um, and you can change it in an instant. And I will do that actually. Uh, I made it 99 cents to start with to just attract interest. I'll probably bump it up to $1.99, okay? Oh no, we better <laughs> buy it right away. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, by the way, I make 35 cents each time you buy an e-copy. So. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the price of gas in Victoria. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, and also, it's also easy to edit the book. Even reading to it tonight, I noticed I made a couple of places I should have indented, which I didn't in the document I sent. It I always can, happens. I can fix that uh, and upload it, and the, the revised copy will be available in a day. So that's yeah. great. Because you can't yeah, do right. that with a traditional publisher, right? They'll just wag, wag the finger at you and say, "No, no, no more changes." <laughs> yeah, all right, and I found a couple. I've, I found a couple of glitches in there, or, or blank places and things like that. There's a little could use a, a bit of editing, but uh, you'll 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 discover that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The er the earlier you buy your book, the more little glitches you'll find. <laughs> I'm fixing it all. <laughs> but, I mean, it's still pretty good. I think I don't think there are many mistakes, but there's a couple little things. Yeah. Uh, one problem I have is I write in Word Perfect, but I but I can I can switch to, yeah. to Word. Right. When I have to like the, and, my book of stories. I I, I mm -hmm. sent them the uh, I sent it to them in Word. But anyway, Ross, I think this might be a particular interest to you because I know you're quite anxious to get some material out there. And this is a no cost option, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you don't have to have a, a stack of books at home trying to pedal. Basically, people just buy them when they want them, right? Yeah. So it's, right, it's, right. it's a nice option. Yeah. And, exactly. and to think that, that people in the UK or Australia, or whatever, can get the book as easily as people in Nelson. This is another thing that's yeah. really very attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no personal fan of Jeff Bezos, but I have to say that in this world where it's so hard to attract the interest of a traditional publisher, this is a very viable option. Yeah. Good. I just like to say I especially like this, this uh, book because I, I have a special interest in the ancient world. And uh, you got me reading Catullus again. Huh? And uh, I dug out my copy of uh, mm. The Eyes of March by Thornton Wilder. 
who has a, a, a Catullus is a big a big uh, uh, character in in that book. Oh. And uh, yeah, I know I know more about the Roman world than the Greek world, but right. uh, I know I know the Roman world came out of the Greek world. <laughs> Uh, the only other thing I, I would say to you people, if you if you do get a, a copy of the book, whether it's an ebook or, or paperback, uh, and you feel you might have the energy to write a review on Amazon, that's always very helpful to an author, um, even yeah. if it's simply clicking a number of stars or a few <laughs> words are great. Now, now it looks like Google does require you to have spent twenty dollars with them over the calendar year over the last year in order to for them to publish a review so that would be a, a restraint if you never use amazon then that's not going to work even if you have the best intentions regrettably but yep. anyway if if you can and do terrific thank you so brian mm -hmm. roger oliver and judy biggin would be pretty interested in this right uh, and I so it doesn't need to be, would they have to befriend you on Facebook or would it have to just be your circle of friends? Do you, do you mean to watch the recording? Yeah. Oh, no. As long as I have sent you the link, you can send the link to whoever you want to. Oh, they good. To yeah, Facebook. they don't have to be on Facebook. Yeah. Like yeah. The number of people that we can do that then. Yeah. For sure. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, we can send them the link. Yeah. We'll send them the link. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, well, I, I hope that piqued your interest, and um, yes, maybe for some of you, it, it, it sure will be did. a route, yeah. a route you might follow. What, one question, Brian. Sure. Uh, the, the photos, is this from your previous uh, trip to Greece yes. or more recent? Yes. When, when I first went to Greece, it was in 1971, and I needn't remind you that cameras weren't nearly as good back then. I had a little Instamatic with me, and although I took quite a few pictures, they look horrible today. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they're all from my more recent trip in 2015, I think it was, Judy, right? Uh, um, yeah. That's not too long. I was lucky. I had a Leica in those days when I was when I was still a journalist, <laughs> mm -hmm. which took some damn good pictures. <laughs> and some of the sites remained, you know, still not so crowded. And I mean, they don't look hugely crowded there. From my photos, you mean? Yes. Well, I have a certain talent for it. <laughs> <laughs> taking pictures and leaving people out of them <laughs> but, but it wasn't that crowded though in truth we we traveled in um late september and october and i think that's a great time to travel in europe uh mm -hmm. weather was good and uh there weren't all the germans were gone, <laughs> the germans were gone. <laughs> could i ask you brian um I noticed that there were quotes in italics that you were reading. What are they from? Oh, the italics. That was Catullus. That was poetry from Catullus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, actually, there was a line from, Aeneid, from Virgil's Aeneid as well. God, so knowledgeable. You can rattle off the Latin too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we, we had to we had to learn to do it in the in the rhythm of the day. Yeah, it was fun. The only Latin I know is what I learned in my as an altar boy. <laughs> and I forgot most of that. <laughs> right. So does the book end up does the book is it kind of a romance or there is romance in it, sort of. What would you say, Ross? Yeah, but it's um, it's um, uh, let's say it's uh, kind of ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and it's like it's sort of like uh, you ride off into the sunset, or, or you <laughs> you both ride off into the sunset at the end. I don't know. But <laughs> my hope is that my hope was that they would get together again. <laughs> right. Next trip. Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Maybe you could write that part. <laughs> yeah. Mexico and then Toronto. And then you have a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now I have to go to Mexico for more research. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> Why not? Oh. Very enjoyable. Thank you so much, Brian. Yep. Thank you. Yes, yes. yes. Superbly yeah. done. Yeah. Thanks a lot yeah. for joining me, nice. guys. I know yeah. it's, everyone has a busy life. I may pick your brain a little bit about about. Um, oh sure. Uh, uh, I, 
self-publishing with Amazon because, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not getting any younger and I'm going to have to bite the bullet somehow. And I spent a lot of money uh, publishing my book of stories. I, I'd rather not have to go. Yeah, uh, may, maybe just, just before I do go, uh, I'll, I'll just review with you. Uh, um, I'm going to have to share my screen here for a second. Um, Paper. Right here. Okay. Just to remind you, oh, is that going to work? Oh, sure it is. Uh, this was the first book I pub self published, and I hired, um, I hired, what's the word I'm looking for? I hired somebody to design the cover and the interior layout. Mm -hmm. He did a great job. I was very happy with the results, but it was not inexpensive. It was fairly yeah. expensive to get that done. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then, of course, I had to get a printer who printed 100 copies. And eventually, after I sold those, we did another hundred. So that was great. <clears throat> but uh, I was happy with the result, but it was not inexpensive. We're talking thousands of dollars, not several thousand, but a few thousand. Okay. Um, mm. Then this was a book that I, a publishing company published for me. Uh, so I, I didn't have to spend as much money. I didn't have much input about the design. Uh, and the layout is okay. But frankly, I think the layout I've done with Echoes is comparable. I don't think it's much different. And I like my cover better than this one. So um, I'm just yeah. showing that uh, the Amazon route doesn't mean you're going to necessarily suffer from quality. I don't think. Yeah. Oh, your, your cover is lovely. It's just spectacular. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It draws one in. You're looking. It's yeah, I like I like that. And Brian, I was going to say, if you ever wanted to do an audio book, I would get it. I really, oh, I you. really like the way you read it. Thank you very much, uh, Joan. Um, that is another option. You can do your own audio book and upload it to Amazon, but they have very strict, mm -hmm. as, as well they should, very strict requirements about the quality of the audio. Uh, yes. and I'm, I have pretty good equipment but I'm still a little nervous about meeting those standards, but it's something I'm going to have a crack at because oh, you know, I like doing it anyway. Um, yeah. And it would be nice to have that third option for people to pick. Yeah. yeah. I love listening to stories too, yeah. especially when, you know, when, when I'd love to be reading, but the eyes need a rest and I yeah. can still have a story. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, well. and some of you probably know this, uh, our own Nelson library has a sound studio in which you can re record high quality stuff like an audiobook. I have not done that myself, uh, but I, I hope to explore that option too. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Unless okay. there's more, I will say goodbye. Thank you again goodbye. so much, Brian. Nice Thank to see everybody coming. too. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.